You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. And welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, joined by returning guest Kevin Simmons, who is going to be talking about one of his recently published articles related to priestly formation. But uh, before we dive in, let me just welcome you back to the show. Kevin, how are you? I'm doing all right. It's been a kind of a sad day today because I got some I got some new I woke up this morning got some news that was uh, kind of sad otherwise it's you know it's been 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 all, doing all right yeah I'm sorry to hear about that I, I know you had mentioned it uh earlier today and um if you want to address that later or now by the way that's fine but yeah I was sad to hear about that yeah I mean just just quick, briefly now um because you know in the past we've talked about Bella Dodd and uh, getting to the heart of a lot of this stuff with communist infiltration of the church and stuff like that. Well, it is it is a sad thing to have to tell everybody, you know, you and your in the audience that uh, Johnny Leininger, the the last surviving uh, signatory of the affidavit about Bella Dodd and infiltrating of Catholic seminaries, infiltration of Catholic seminaries, she passed away last week. Today uh, is June 1st, today is the wake, and tomorrow is the funeral down in Texas. The obituary is online, people can look it up. Um, but with her passing, that basically is almost the close of, of an age at this point in Catholic history here in the United States. She was a very good woman. Uh, I don't know if I've ever really gone into great length. I think I have at least some length about how how it all came to be, but I, I knew Johnine and her husband, Paul, personally. Um, long story short, my first teaching job after I graduated from Franciscan with my master's was in a little a little town in Texas called Victoria, Texas. <clears throat> and I taught at a Catholic high school there. And I got to know the Leiningers through the local extraordinary form community in that area through a couple, Paul and Marjorie Tassin. Uh, Paul himself has since gone to God, but uh, uh, Mrs. Tassin is still alive. Matter of fact, she was the one that wrote me the email to notify me this morning um, about John Ean's passing. But uh, so that's how we all got to know each other. And then on top of it, I want to say it was her grandson or grand grandnephew. Uh, uh, his name is Tom. John Ean's relative Tom is a household brother of mine from Franciscan University. Uh, Tom and his sister went to Franciscan back between 2000 and 2004, I want to say. So there are all these different connections. And that's how I knew about uh, the Leiningers. And I knew about the relationship with the Von Hildebrands that I was able to write about it in that essay, uh, you know, rethinking you know, communist infiltration of the church in Bella Dodd there. Um, so th yeah, that's all these really cool, interesting connections. And there's a whole big story there, but that's, that's the story in a nutshell. So uh, you know, Johnny, I believe, was 88 years old, according to the to the um, uh, to the obituary. And there are pictures of her on Facebook if anybody wanted to look her up. But she she, she had an account there and pictures are there. Um, but yeah, so I just, you know, if people just in their charity would pray for her. Um, I am happy to say that uh, some I'm, I'm presently looking into it. So I don't know for sure, but I will at least say this much. Somebody else has stepped forward, uh, an older woman, also in her 80s, uh, who claims to have known Bella Dodd and had conversation with her. We are presently looking into this to see if this is the real deal. And if so, I'm hoping we'll be able to uh, uh, record her testimony for posterity's sake. Um, so, yeah. So that's... That's that story. So please do pray for Johnny and Leininger. Yeah. Now tell me about the article that you recently published. What's the name of it and where, where did you publish it? Sure. Uh, it's called The Wheat and the Tares, A Reflection Upon Contemporary Priestly Formation. It was published last week on May 27th uh, over at Homiletics and Pastor, Homiletics, excuse me, and Pastoral Review. So 
hprweb.com. Uh, I can do a screen share so people can see it if, if, if they like, but uh, it's, it's available on there. Um, are we able to do a screen share or? Yeah, you should not? be able to go ahead and share the screen and I'll admit it. Okay. I'm hoping this works. Uh, mm -hmm. Yay. Okay. Oh, great. Now everybody gets to see the rest of my, uh, <laughs> they get to see my, uh, my folders at the top. <laughs> there they are. My miraculous metal research work and uh, all this cool stuff. But um, yeah, so this is this this is the article, and um, this article was a long time in coming. Uh, I it's been in the works for quite a while, uh, but it's basically, as the title suggests, reflecting upon contemporary priestly formation. A lot of people kind of know me, especially through RNT, as like the Fatima guy, the third part of the secret guy, or um, you know the, the, the consecration of Russia, you know that kind of those kinds of discussions. And my background in Fatima studies certainly is an important key to understanding how I constructed this article. More on that a little bit later, <clears throat> but uh, just just give a heads up, I. I I want to switch gears a little bit and not put on the Fatima hat, as it were, in this broadcast, as opposed to I just want to be a normal guy, a normal Catholic, talking about things of concern uh, and contemporary issues here in the church from personal experience, both my own experience as well as the experiences of others, of which in this case, I'm sad to say, is a good number of people. Um, so I just want to make, add that caveat there. But before I get into the, the to the to the guts of it all, the basic point of this article is talking about priestly formation and why is it that some of these things that we see going on in the church today are happening. This is my adventure, my foray, if you will, into asking some of these questions, but pointing them out as well, pointing different, making observations for people, you know, especially after the McCarrick stuff and then the summer uh, of 2000, I'm sorry, the, the events of 2002, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people have been asking questions and this essay is very much related to that. And so I wanted to talk about it because I see some of the problems as stemming from things that happen in seminary. So that's the overall purpose of this. Uh, and then providing some, some possible things that bishops can do to start looking at to remedy the situation. So that's basically the nuts and bolts. Uh, now, where does all of this come from? As I said, I was a former seminarian. I won't say for what diocese, because, and I will be bluntly honest as to why I will not say what diocese. It's not that I don't want to. It's just that uh, some of the things that happened to me and things that happened to other people are very serious. And uh, they would rise if I talked about them, quite frankly, they would rise to the level of my potentially being sued. So I'm being brutally honest with everybody. I cannot say certain things. I would like to, but I cannot say certain things. And I'm not trying to be bombastic. I'm just being real with everybody. Um, I would likely be sued. So, you know, if everybody's expecting this confessional guts hanging out place, you know, talking about all kinds of stuff and dishing out, ragging on people. That's not what we're here to do. Um, and I think it's a good thing um, because, you know, people still have rights, even the guilty. And there are guilty people in the church. Um, the sins and shortcomings of our spiritual fathers, as it were. Um, so this article is born from a deep, deep place of experience, pain, uh, suffering, not only just myself, but other people. 
it begins pretty, you know, innocuously enough. And uh, I did it that way deliberately because I wanted to set a good tone, at least. This is not a conspiracy. This is not, a, you know, airing the dirty laundry out of the church, uh, out the church's dirty laundry out. I didn't want to take that path because I see it as being very, uh, how shall we say, uh, how should I say it? I see it as being very unedifying to do that with uh, just airing the church's dirty laundry. As much as I believe sunlight is the best disinfectant, we also have to be mindful of certain other things. Uh, like uh, other people do have rights. Even if they trample on ours, it doesn't matter. People still have rights. And I believe wholeheartedly that as followers of Jesus Christ, we serve him, and the manner in which we serve him reflects on him. Kind of like that movie, The Patriot, with Mel Gibson. I don't know if you saw the movie, uh, Mike, but uh, there's that scene where the bad guy is reprimanded by the general, the British general, and uh, you know, and he makes a comment about how you know the manner in which you serve reflects upon me, and he has to look good to, I think it was King George the Third. I think you know King George there over in England. So it's, uh, I think we have to be mindful of our own role as Christians and the manner in which we serve Christ. So I wrote this article where it's a bit higher minded, but while still telling stories, some of which admittedly are a little on edge. Um, people will read this and be like, oh my goodness, are you serious? You know, and, I, and it's, yes, <laughs> these things happened. So I make the analogy about wheat and the tares. There are the wheat being the good and the tares being the bad. It comes straight out of uh, St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, Matthew 13, 24 through 30. And there are these tares, the, the fake wheat, if you will, that have grown up alongside the real wheat. But it isn't until the harvest, a.k.a. the eschaton, at the end of time, when Jesus, the harvester, if you will, tells the workers to cut it, the angels, as some people put it, uh, to cut everything all at once, separate the wheat from the, from, from the tares or the chaff, and throw the tares into the burning fire, which traditionally is some symbolized hell. Um, so I... I, I decided to go that kind of a route with this because I think that the analogy fits. In our contemporary priestly formation programs today, many of them at least, um, wheat has come up with the tares. Tares have come up with the wheat. And the U.S. bishops have reflected upon this fact in one of their, in, in really, I guess, a number of the documents, but the, the fifth, the program of priestly formation, fifth edition came out around 2005, 2006. And they talked about what you see here as many significant elements of context, particular to the U.S. at the beginning of the 21st century. That's church speak, basically, for we got a lot of bad things going on and uh, here in our cultural problems, and these things affect guys coming into seminary. And there are 12 elements, uh, but I focused on four. Weaknesses of ethical standards and a moral relativism, the environment of which has affected the church herself. The second, Catholics who are inactive or semi-active or just badly catechized. Three, diverse and dysfunctional families. And four, differences over church doctrine. <clears throat> and between the 12 and these four, they kind of work together. There's a certain harmony or interplay between them all. Uh, and I distinguish, uh, well, the bishops distinguish, of course, just to point things out specifically, but they are all interconnected in some way, shape, or form. And I decided to begin with the third one, diverse and dysfunctional families, because this is actually at the heart of priestly formation. Having a strong human formation is at the heart of any priestly formation program. It's not the end all be all. It's actually the supernatural supernatural sanctification of the soul is supposed to have pride of place according to Pope uh, Pius XII uh, back, in the, back in the document he issued in the 1950s. 
But since we've had a lot of bad things happen in the 20th century that have led to the denigration of marriage, marriage life, and family, um, a lot of people are growing up now, a lot of young men in this case, but women too in, in their way, but since we're talking about priestly formation, a lot of men, a lot of boys uh, have grown up in very bad situations where you know there's no daddy around there's a you know deadbeat dad or um you know they, they growing up without a sense of purpose or i mean whatever it may be a lot of these guys have grown up with a very bad formation and this formation typically surrounds four different pillars um uh, that were that were distinguished by John Paul II in an, in an instruction called Pastoris Dabo Vobis, I will give you shepherds. And those four pillars are human, spiritual, intellectual, and pastoral. You'll see them here in the document, uh, the article, Formation of Human, Spiritual, Intellectual, and Pastoral. In some way, shape, or form, we'll, we'll, all of these get touched upon. <clears throat> but the big one that we find nowadays is human formation. A lot is made up to be a lot a lot goes into this human formation concern because it is at the foundation of the others um so uh so an example of of a human formation social skills social graces how gracious are you in conversation do you let you know are you rude to people you know so, for instance, uh, this is not a seminary story, but the guy later went on to become a monk. Um, there was somebody that I interact, an example of social graces in human formation. <clears throat> uh, I was in a conversation once with a, a gentleman who was, I think at the time, somewhere between 16 and 18 years of age. This was June of 2016. Uh, he was very, very musically talented and played a certain instrument. And I asked this gentleman, I said, oh, do you know the, the, the song to Xanarkand? Now, of course, for those of you who know, that's a Final Fantasy X reference, of course. You know, So we've got the inside thing going on here. And this gentleman didn't know what it was. And he asked me, he was like, I, no, what is that? And I said, I said, oh, it's a, it's a song from, from a video game called you know, Final Fantasy X. And the guy says to me in a snotty way, oh, well... That's why I've never heard of it. He said, I wouldn't debase myself to, uh, to, to play such a thing. This is how he was talking to me. I'm a grown guy. I was in my mid-30s at the time. And I'm like, excuse me? That's just rude. you know. Or if I may do my, uh, my Angela Johnson bone quickly, rude. You know, um, it, it was rude. So that's an example of social graces as it connects to human formation. So enough on human formation. I think we've got, I think we've got the gentle gist on that. Spiritual would be things like, you know, your prayer life. Do you take the spiritual life seriously? Do you pray? Do you go to mass? Uh, or, you know, adoration, you know, other the Jesus prayer. I mean, all kinds, the act of this, different things. Are you a spiritual guy? Do you live the spiritual life? Do you exercise the spiritual side of your nature? Uh, intellectual, of course, like academic, you know, uh, how are, are you are you okay there or do you are you you know you don't have to be you don't have to be intellectually towering giant but you know are are you do you get what's going on you know or are you learning pastoral is more about your tact with people and being able to be judicious in situations so for instance um a priest friend of mine recently told me about how he had to, he, he is in the diocese with COVID restrictions and uh, by the policies from, in, from the bishop. Well, he, he had to dispense from, the, from those policies at some point, or at least one or a couple of them, because there was a funeral for a four-year-old in his parish. No priest in their right mind is going to sit there and tell the grieving family of a four-year-old child who, you know, who just died. You can't have so and so here at the funeral. You can't. You can't. That's not. No. No. So the pastoral. Uh, so that pastoral formation is: Are you well formed in how to be pastoral? Can you uh, judge situations and act appropriately and act accordingly? You know, 
that's a basic understanding of what that would be, of course. So those, those examples, those four pillars, <clears throat> excuse me. And so around these four pillars, a lot of the formation happens of, of men to be priests. Um, and in, in days of old, the sacrament of marriage provided a strong structure uh, for young men and women to learn to be human, know what it means to be a human, and to be a practicing Catholic. But we've had such a denigration of marriage and family life here in the West because of the cultural and sexual revolutions and all the culture comps and that, all, that, all, that, all, those, all those things that people don't really know anymore what it means to be a man. Or, you know, in the case of women, they don't know what it means to be a woman. Uh, and there's all kinds of conversations that are taking place about this right now, both public as well as private. But I think generally people get the point. <clears throat> so I won't belabor it. I won't, you know, belabor it. But as I say in the article, the present cultural malaise that is experienced by many families today, that is, has thrown this structure into disarray. And much can be said about what this malaise is and how it has affected the family. But I like to call it a disordering or a disorientation. Now, that's where the Fatima stuff especially starts coming in, because that's what Sister Lucia had called it, a diabolical disorientation. That uh, She said that we were traversing a period of darkness that was being promoted by the powers of hell, she said, or powers of darkness. So that's definitely Fatima kind of coming out of me here <laughs> a little bit. Um, People became untethered, I said, from eternal principles and sound reason in favor of a selfish understanding of human freedom and liberty, whereby one declares, my will, not thine, be done. Or as Peter Kreft famously uh, said, the national anthem of hell as I did it my way, uh, or words to that effect. Then, of course, you had the era of materialism that maintains that there's only this material world and not a spiritual one. So all of these things kind of just cluster bombed and have had a very serious impact upon the church. Add to that the fact that we also had Vatican II and all of these changes that were supposed to be implemented, but these the, the implementation of these changes came up against this cultural revolution, and it, it, it was a nightmare, absolute total nightmare. Uh, Let's see, let's see. Uh, disordered relationships have also led to a lack of authentic fathers and father figures, I said in many places. Not a few young boys have been led into numerous errors of relationship with respect to what it means to be a man, proper interactions with women and children, etc. They have not developed a healthy masculine identity. And we hear about this a lot, I said, in our culture today in terms of toxic masculinity. And I don't mean that in some vague liberal-esque way, I mean it as truly some guys are just toxic uh, because, you know, they think that, you know, you know, sleeping with every woman somehow proves your manhood. And it's like, no, that's, that's, that's not it at all. Um, I kind of think about, an ex I didn't put this in the article, but several years ago when they were the Baltimore, Maryland riots um, and up and, and social unrest there, there's that one guy, his mother saw him on the television, and she went down to where all the rioting was going on. And in front of all of his friends and whatnot, she was hitting, she was slapping him around. And, and I mean, I sat there, I was cheering that lady on. I was like, you go, seriously. And then some public official, I don't remember if it was the mayor or the governor, but I remember watching a follow-up, and the, the 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 politician said, if more parents were like that, our job would be a lot easier. Well, yeah, exactly. These things are supposed to be hit, done on the local level, subsidiarity, right? And that, that unfortunately, they're not. And people depend upon the government to solve problems. It's not the way it's supposed to work. Um, <clears throat> and so because of all these issues, uh, bishops have had to come to terms with them, and they have to reconsider the standards for the reception and retention of applicants for priestly formation. They had to assess this. Um, and there's always been a kind of a, a spectrum and different. everybody's going to fall on a different path or a different spectrum or a different point on that spectrum. Um, and so no one is considered perfectly formed when he signs his application to the seminary. Otherwise, he'd be ordained on the spot. Um, but 
what is and is not acceptable nowadays has had to be rethought. So one, one thing, I didn't say this in the article, but one thing that has to be, that, that has been, I think, strongly reconsidered is matters of sexual purity. Back in the day, uh, if somebody was a habitual masturbator, for instance, committing the solitary sin, or um, you know, really struggled with women, that such a person would not be allowed into formation, generally speaking. They had to develop the habitus of continency and, and, and chastity uh, and demonstrate that sufficiently. Nowadays, that's not really so much the case. Uh, so different seminaries will look at it differently, of course, and you know, but the general expectation is you, you can work on these problems in the seminary. And there's room to debate this. <clears throat> uh, I personally fall on the side of I think that some issues need to be worked on before someone goes to seminary. I actually have a story to this effect. Uh, in my experience, talking with a seminarian who confided some in, in, information to me about, about himself, I was quite shocked. At, how are you still at, the, at, at a seminarian, you know? And the guy just looked at me and said, you know, well, they believe I have a vocation. I was like, after what you just told me, are you serious? You know, so this is what I mean by different people will have different expectations and things of that sort. Uh, and it's going it's going to vary. I happen to disagree with uh, his seminary. I couldn't believe that they let him stay. I was like, uh, uh, no, this this don't work. This don't work. Um, but anyway, so uh, this is a, that gradualism, as it were. And so there's a tension that forms because. The gospel still needs to be preached, but we need guys to do it. But now you got these guys that got problems. How do we reconcile this? The way that the bishops have largely decided to do it is to uh, go back to the drawing board of the stand, what is considered to be acceptable or not. Um, and so, uh, as I said in the article, the... The, the idea is that if the bishops waited to ordain men until they were at level, formational standard levels that were culturally provided for, for in previous decades of the well-regulated family life, then the present priest shortages would be even worse than they are now. Uh, so they've adopted uh, this propedeutic or the spirituality year. Uh, some people also refer to it as a pastor year, but that's actually a separate phenomenon, as far as I understand it. That's a separate reality and priestly formation nowadays. Um, and so I think that this, this principle of gradualism, it has a place, but uh, and what it means is that applicants are assessed according to where they stand in relation to those pillars of formation. And even the bishops say that there are certain standards that if you don't meet them, you can't go to seminary. Um, and that's very largely subjective. And I have seen that subjectivity. Um, when I was in seminary, there was a guy, I won't say his name, that all of us were asking the same question. How did he pass the Sykes? I couldn't say anything because... I was, I'm, I'm, as we'll get into, I'm what, what was known as an, in the church as an adult vocation. And I had 20 years of theology and experience behind me. And my superiors were very on edge about all of that. As a matter of fact, they rejected my application at first. Um, my seminary actually rejected the application that my diocese had put in. And they did it for whatever reason. I was texted about it, and I still have the text messages. I can show them people. Um, and, of course, you know, I was like, well, what the, what's going on? I don't understand. It was a little disoriented, a little unsettling. Um, but the diocese pushed it, pushed, you know, uh, pushed the application through, gave what I, the only word, the word that was used to me was they gave certain assurances to the seminary 
and I was accepted, but they put me on probation. And when I got the letter from the rector, and I still have the letter, I can read it, um, he didn't say the reason for your probation is this. Instead, it was a bunch of, well, there's a I don't, I don't mean to be rude, but there was a bunch of verbal vomit. You had to read between the lines, basically. And um, I consulted with trusted persons, and they had to explain this to me because I was like, what is going on here? So they explained it to me in terms of, Kevin, they just want to make sure that with your background that you're going to play nice in the sandbox with everybody. I'm like, well, I can do that. That's not a problem. So because I was on this probation, I had to watch everything I said and did so as not to give a bad impression and make them think that, you know, I'm trying to act like I'm the authority or something. It, it, it was a very tough time of my life, to say the least. Very, very tough time. And when I, so when I, when I saw this one gentleman, all of us were asking that question, how did he pass the Sykes? How the heck is this guy here? Um, you know, it was hard because I knew what was going on. You know, I, I've been around this stuff, but I couldn't say or do anything. I couldn't. Um, and eventually, and I will say, I will say this part of the story. All of us were asking, or at least most of us were asking questions, but he was deemed fit to stay there. But what finally got him gone, finally forced the powers to be to make him leave. And I heard this direct from one of the guys involved in the story. I heard it straight from the horse's mouth. Um, this guy got upset because in an October, in a, during a, during an October that I was in the seminary, he they were, had movie night and they didn't watch the movie that he wanted to or it got canceled, something like that. And uh, he wrote out a several page long manifesto in murderous hands written script saying something to the effect of if you think I'm strange you should see my friends he took the he took the, these papers took a knife I'm not lying I tell you this is the honest truth this is 2000 like tens okay took a knife put it through the paper and put the sharp end into a, like a bar of soap or something like that and left it out in a public place for anybody to see in the seminary well some people found it all right uh that guy was gone within 48 hours and it took that level for people to finally respond. And I couldn't say anything or do anything because, and not, as well as other people. We all knew it. We all talked about it behind closed doors and whispers. We all knew about it. Um, but this is the kind of stuff that, uh, that, that I'm talking about is there has to be some level of uh, of base formation that to build upon. And that's very subjective nowadays, very, very subjective. But the story I just told you, told you is true. And it's a perfect example of what I'm talking about, about the subjectivity. Others saw this and were very concerned. You know, as a matter of fact, the gentleman that told me the story who, who found, he was one of the guys that found the knife actually said that's the first time since i've been in seminary that i slept with my door locked that night you know you know and, and seminary formators and officials have the have the duty of protecting the institution as well as the community if, according to the church's formation documents and i think that's when this finally happened i think that you know that's when everybody, re that's when they finally saw that this, no, he's got to go. Uh, but it's sad. It's sad that it took that level of, of an event when there were many flags, many warning signs before that. But again, you have to have a base formation, basic foundation. If you don't, you know, you can't be there. Um. So yeah, so there's that. And then the next section that I get into in the article is differences over church doctrine. Um, I don't really think that this is a matter of development as say, of doctrine, as I said in the article. I think it's about the rejection 
of established doctrine already. You know, we there's that false sense of liberty is one of those culture wars that we had, you know, uh, free to do as I want, do what thou will should be the whole of the law, said Aleister Crowley, and that kind of stuff, that kind of attitude. You know, people wanted a life that was untethered or unencumbered by a God who imposes limits. Well, you know, within this structure that gets created of this godlessness, you know, there's no thought of regard for a healthy fear of God, only for the opinions of men and what they can do with power, control, or in some cases, as I said in the article, brute force. Now, this is a very important point because it sets up for what I talk about later on in the article. <clears throat> um, basically, people lost the script. You know, they lost that sense of uh, Catholic, was that Catholic sense of things, that they lost the script. And lies and falsehoods went around faster, as the old expression goes, than the truth can get it faster than the truth can get its boots on. Um, so under John Paul II and Benedict XVI, things were getting a little bit better, but it takes a while for these things to take root, you know, and a building that has been destroyed is not rebuilt immediately. Or as Father John Zulsdorf says, brick by brick, you know, um, restoring the church is no different. It's going to take a little while. These errors were allowed to spread and much care and tact are necessary to undo in order to undo these evils. But it's messy. It's messy. And cleaning it up is going to be messy, too. Um, you know, these errors are not just about seminarians. They're also about the seminary formators as well. Uh, the very people, as I said in the article, tasked with the responsibility of priestly formation. Um, and it seems stark. But I think a lot of us need to have these conversations because if we don't talk about it uh, respectfully and charitably, I think uh, if we don't talk in that way, if we don't talk about charitably, we're gonna we're nothing's ever gonna get done, you know. So I begin. I open up. I, that's this is where the conversation and the article kind of shifts, and I talk about celibacy and the authentic formation of spiritual fathers. Now, I want to be very clear. I believe very strongly in the discipline of clerical celibacy for the Latin church. I wholeheartedly agree with it. I'm not challenging it here in this article. I mean, I have to be extremely clear because some people reading this would sit there and say, what, you don't think priests should be celibate? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that there's a discipline in the Latin church and for it to be maintained, there's a lot of bad things that have crept up around it, dredge and dross, if you will, that have darkened the discipline, I guess. It, it, it has tainted the discipline. It, it's twisted or warped this discipline. So if we're going to keep it, which I believe we should, we need to cleanse it of these, of the vines and these terrible, the tears that have grown up around that does this particular discipline. So what I think is going, so what are, what's going on here? Well, we, we talked about how marriage and family life has suffered. And as a result, children growing up in the, again, amidst this malaise have received bad formation. People have forgotten how to form young men into holy and mature men of God. There's no real cultural supports anymore, you know, um, uh, to do that. And the same is true even within the church. Sorry to say, but that's the honest truth of it. But if you have a man, uh, if you have a if you have a boy who's on a healthy track in life, and being taught these things, he's going to be a healthy individual as a man, uh, functioning well have good relationships with fellow men and women and children, you know, however, I mean, there's all different kinds of things we can say there. And there are safeguards that come with this. A man's strength is supposed to be in service to others. If he doesn't have that component, that, that other directedness, He's going to become selfish. And that's where we start turning into those conversations on toxic masculinity. Uh, we see it all the time. Leaderless, fatherless, you know, dis disoriented boys nowadays that are trying to prove their manhood, you know, 
by, you know, having sex with a woman outside of marriage or, you know, stealing something or some other bold, daring act that he gets status with his friends or something, his crew. It's a parody of, of manhood, of course. But it's very much a problem in our, in our society today. And so if you are taught to use your, if, if for, as a boy is growing up, if he's taught to orient that strength towards service to others, that in the uh, male-female relationship, we're talking about marriage, especially. And if he's not oriented towards that, and knowing that he, that he that 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 strength is geared or oriented towards serving wife and family, um, and just turns selfish, turns inwards, collapses in on himself. Um, and so this turns into fatherhood questions about fatherhood, because that's the natural trajectory of any man is to be a father, be it in the physical sense, husband and father of children or spiritual father. If you're going to go the route of natural fatherhood, there are things in place that come with that. You have to look after others. You know, you have people who are directly dependent upon you, a wife and children. You have to keep a roof over their head and food on the table and put clothes on the backs. You know, now that's not to say a mother can't do any of these things, but we're focusing on men at the moment because of priestly formation. So orienting yourself, rooting yourself in these basic human things keeps you on task, keeps you focused. If you are being trained for spiritual fatherhood in the celibate context, you are no less called to do the same thing. The difference is when you go home at night, it's to an empty rectory unless you have an associate pastor or something. You know, you don't have a wife and children to go home to. You care for God's people. You have to be other directed. You have to be uh, thinking about them and their well-being certainly spiritual, but sometimes with physical needs too. And oftentimes there's a blend between the two. If you're not taught that, you're going to miss the boat. You, you're, you're going, you've lost the plot, basically. And you have to develop that somehow. And when you're in seminary, that is supposed to be what you do. That's the job of seminary formators, is to instill that in a guy. As I said in the article, the seminary is assigned the task of developing a healthy masculine identity, taking great pains to train a man to exercise his masculinity in the direction of spiritual fatherhood. Clerical sexual abuse uh, has created some very serious questions with respect to priestly formation programs. Take, for example, the scandalous behavior of Travis Clark of Louisiana. How did he manage to get through seminary and become a priest, only to desecrate his parish's altar with two women? Uh, I use this case as an example of what we're talking about because uh, J.D. Flynn, who now works for The Pillar, but he was working for another organization at the time, uh, news organization, he wrote an article where people at the, the seminary professors, one of them admitted that there were issues with, with, uh, with, with Clark, but that he often, quote, seemed to be flying under the radar, end quote. How could he fly under the radar? I mean, weren't people supposed to be looking out for this stuff? You know, I won't repeat what this man did. It was so terrible, but I will simply say it was so bad with that altar that they actually had to take out that altar, destroy it, and put a whole new altar in the parish. Um, so I, in the article, I say, you know, there are, we can different. There are different ways to address the question that we asked about flying under the radar and getting how how does this happen. And a lot of these answers are based upon the individual circumstances of the seminarian or priest. But I think we need to look at the system itself as well, it, um, or the way of thinking within seminary programs. You know, we need, it's not just about individual people. It's also about how errors have impacted our institutions, many of which were co-opted to in order to promote or propagate error. Um, it's people adopt and propagate error, but institutions can serve, as I said, as a mechanism by which these errors are inculcated and propagated. And basically, I say that there are 
um, systemic corruption, questionable ideologies, um, structures of sin that contribute to the malformation of seminarians. And that relationship, I say, between celibacy and control is one of them. Basically, the point that I'm driving at here, just to keep it simple, is one of the problems that has arisen with the, with the clerical celibacy discipline in the Latin church is these guys that are formed nowadays, many of them, um, because they don't have that natural safeguard of having to think about others, it's a lot easier for them to be taken advantage of by uh, clerics, especially seminary formators. How does this work, Kevin? This sounds like a pretty serious claim here. Well, uh, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong. O ye who is going to, uh, uh, or, or in the process of becoming Byzantine, ask any Byzantine bishop or Byzantine priest about the power of the presbytera, the priest wife. The Eastern bishops, be they Orthodox or the Eastern Catholics, they all know the one thing you don't do is tick off the presbytera. Hell hath no fury, right? She puts her foot down, the bishop will back down. So they all know, don't tick off the presbytera. She'll get you, and she will. That's the power of a woman. She'll get you, you know. Or is that famous line from my big fat Greek wedding? <laughs> you know, the head may be the man may be the head, but the woman is the neck, and she can turn the man's head any way she wants. You know, great line, very true. Uh, and it's true. She has a lot of power. And in fact, a priest's first duty, a married priest's first duty is not to his parish, not to his flock, it is to his wife and children. They all know this in the Eastern churches. But that's not a component in Latin thinking. Because clerical celibacy. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not saying that celibacy is bad. I'm saying that it is a down, it is a, it is it is a drawdown to the discipline of celibacy because just the natural path of it. You can think certain things, or you're more inclined to because you don't have that that factor in there of wife and children. And so what has happened now, especially after all of these errors that have cropped up, is priests in the Latin church are uh, treated differently by the bishops in part because they can get away with it, basically. They don't have that natural barrier that is the presbyter out to put her foot down and say, you're not doing that to my husband. I've got three kids over here to feed. You think, you think we're going to put them up with that? Uh-uh. You know. I may go, you know, funny like that, you know, that, no, that barrier isn't there. So the bishops can just, it's easy now to treat them a certain way. What is that way? It's what I and others call corporatism. It's corporatism is a kind of an error where it's an error where you, bishops can be inclined not to treat their priests as spiritual sons and understand themselves as spiritual fathers, but instead the bishops think of themselves as CEOs of a corporation and the priests are their employees and to be treated accordingly, I might add, hired and fired at will. This error runs rampant among the episcopate nowadays. And among the clergy, the lower clergy too, it does. It it, it affects it, but it's it's all across the board. This is one of these errors, because what's the old expression? Wheresoever the the world goes, so the church, or vice versa, where the church goes, so so. The errors that have affected us in the world have crept into the church, and this the error of corporatism is one of them. Priests are treated badly; they get burned out. Some of them, like I know of one priest 
uh, who he was ordained and immediately given four parishes. Four parishes. Newly ordained. And I would like to say, I won't say who, but he had a relapse into alcoholism. No surprise. And he had to take time off to get help. No surprise. Four parishes, newly ordained. Four parishes. It's wrong. Um, and, but again, because there is not that safeguard that marriage brings, it's easier now, because remember, the purpose of celibacy is it frees a man uh, in order to serve God's people, but it stands as a sign of what is to come, right? The sign of the kingdom to come. Uh, that's the purpose of celibacy. So priests are able to go and do things, but if you've got, and that's fine, but if you've got this corporatist attitude, corporatism underlying this, mm, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really, really bad. Um, very terrible, in fact. So I began, the in the article, I began talking about these things in the context of younger men. It's a very well-known practice that bishops and seminary formators in general like to have young guys to go to their seminaries. Eight, nowadays, like 18 to 30, roughly. Um, but then you had guys like me that the church calls uh, adult vocations. Vocationes adultorum, I believe, is the name of the Latin document uh, that talked about this, I think, written in the 70s, I want to say. Um, but the younger guys are more malleable. They have less life experience, and so they... and Quite frankly, they know less, many of them, than, uh, and so it, it's easier to form and train those. When you have guys that were adult, that are of adult vocations, they have a life experience. Some might have been married before. Maybe their wife died or, uh, or there was an annulment or whatever, you know, uh, or they, they had children. They had to raise children. So these components are in their brains and in their hearts. And that becomes an issue in formation. Believe it or not, you something that simple. Actually, you'd be surprised that becomes a formation issue for many of many seminarians because these guys that go through seminary, the adult vocations, they see what they're asked to do, basically to be uh, company yes men, basically, to the bishops, um, or flunkies, dare I say. And they're like, I can't do that. This isn't right. But the young guys, ah, uh, they don't have that frame of reference in their head. You know, they don't have that. So this is a this is one of those things where a general good principle has has got some of that dredge and dross around it of the malleability, younger guys, etc. You know, um, you know, they don't have that job experience, practical training. Um and they're very deeply influenced by a lot of these errors. Um, and then I, I, I noted in the article about how these problems are further compounded by educational expectations within the United States, such as going to college right after high school and the emphasis upon trade schools. That's actually rooted in a, a unique experience. I myself am a former teacher and uh, I'm, I'm going to say it out loud. I knew Charlotte Isabit. May she rest in peace. She passed away four four months ago. She was very big in talking about the problems within the educational department, educational system within the United States, and how it was co opted by communist and Soviet thinking. Um, and so we emphasize a lot from from this this line was about kind of came from discussions that I've had about education and all my my own experience in this. Um, we we do it we do de-emphasize trade schools. Well, some people, quite frankly, are not meant to go to college. They don't have the acumen or the aptitude for it. Now that's not saying that they're stupid. Uh-uh. No. The guy that the guy that is a mechanic and went to a trade school, he doesn't mean he's stupid. He's just good with like just good with machines, you know? And I I'm not good with machines, so we help one another. This is part of the harmony within society. We each have gifts. And we're meant to help one another with them, gifts and talents given to us by God. 
And uh, if kids go into college and not the workforce, uh, you know, depends upon that. It can go either way. It's not a sin to do either one. But when you are emphasizing college so much and trade schools, you know, mm, trade schools get downplayed. Again, you're losing out on an awful lot. Just in the news the other day, they, you know how some guys, they they have the signing when they're in high school. They have a signing to go to sign off for a, a, a college team. <coughs> well, there was a school, it was just in the news, that si- this, uh, there was a, a senior, I think he was, he was signing uh, for a job being a plumber or a plumber's apprentice. First time they said that that's ever happened in their school's history. And I was like, well, good. Celebrate this guy going to a trade school. Nothing wrong with it. No shame in it. They make good money too, I might add. Um, that's all that that's behind all of that with respect to educational expectations and that line. You know, as I said in the article, having these things do much to contribute to a young man's growth and development into manhood. If he's called to matrimony, sacrament matrimony, and uh, that call being responsible for others often accelerates. That maturation. He can't be a bachelor, accountable only for himself, as I said. His family looks to him for those various needs in conjunction with his wife, that is. Um, men called to, uh, to the priesthood in the Latin church being celibate, they have to have that same sense of self-worth, responsibility, manhood, and fatherhood because all of these qualities are necessary in the priesthood. But the path to having these qualities or developing these qualities is going to be different. And it is the task of seminary formation to ensure that it is unobstructed. He has to be given opportunities to do this. And that may happen to some lesser or greater degrees, depending upon what seminary that you're at. But nevertheless, it still has to be there. And seminarians, especially young guys, they entrust themselves, believe in that people know what they're doing and why, and that they're, they're, uh, the authorities have the best interests of the seminarians at heart. I'm sorry to say, but that's not always the case. It's nice on paper. It's the nice, uh, it's the ideal, you know, but what is it that Barbosa says in the Pirates of the Caribbean? The more like guidelines, you see, uh, with the Pirates Code there. <laughs> Who would have thought? On the day with Johnny Depp uh, wins the case against Amber Heard, I would have gotten the Pirates of the Caribbean reference in there. <laughs> um, you know, it, you know, it, it doesn't always happen. I'm sorry to say, but it doesn't. I mean, New York, the Archdiocese in New York just had a huge case of this with that Anthony Gorgia al- a- a- allegations. If what he said was true, yes, that would be a gross uh, miscarriage. Of his of having his best interests at heart, of not having his best interests at heart, um, miscarriage of justice, dare I say, that his claim was he witnessed homosexuality, homosexual behavior, and when they realized that he that when, when they found it, when they knew that he knew, he was basically thrown away. That's his claim. I don't know if it's true or not. Uh, I'm just saying I'm, what, what the court documents say. But if what Anthony Gorge just said was true. This would be a perfect example of not having the seminarian's best interests at heart. That case aside, it does often happen otherwise where they don't. Like, for instance, that gentleman that I said earlier that everybody, seminarians were saying, why, how is he here? You know, the seminary was not the place for him. It was obvious to many of us, but for some reason, the formators didn't see that until he took the knife, literally. Seminarians have few to no rights. Seminarians are completely at the mercy of their superiors and the Holy See. And that's a great trust. When you put your hands like that into the hands of your formators, you you expect them, you demand even that they know what to do with you. Because that that's you are entrusting your entire well-being. You don't you don't have a job, you know. You, you, your job is you know, to study, you know, to be a seminarian. So uh, even the Holy See points out that that mutual trust between formators and the seminarian is a necessary element. Uh, If it's gone, if there is no trust, there can be no formation. And believe me, I know from personal experience what that means. You know, so the the program of formation is supposed to be well-oiled and 
part of that being well oil, as I said in the article, is striking a healthy balance between autonomy and obedience within the seminarian. He's not supposed to be a drone or a company man, a yes man, yes man, you know, yes bishop. Not everything the bishop wants to do is true. But this, this and this problem goes all the way back in our history. You know, back in the day uh, in other dioceses uh, throughout the world before the foundation of our country, they had the chapter of canons. And the chapter of canons served to keep the, bishop, the power of the bishop in check. No, bishop, uh, you can't do that, you know. Well, because we, but because we don't have that, that structure here in the United States, that chapter of canons, bishops have an awful lot of power, and some of them are not ashamed to abuse that power. Yes, I, I use that word. Um, you're not supposed to be a drone or a company man. That's very unbecoming of a man, just being a company man. But there are guys that do it because they don't know any better. They fall right for it. They don't see it. The guys who are adult vocations, however, can still fall into that error, but it's less likely because of their experience. That, that experience acts as the barrier now and say, uh, I don't really think that's what we're supposed to be doing. That's not what that means, you know. Well, who are you? You know, we know what we're doing. Do you think that, do you know better than us? These are things that actually happen. I'm, I'm not lying. I'm not making this. I'm not be, making caricatures here. This stuff happens. It's not a joke. Um, you know, uh, as I and so I said in the article, the, the idea is if, if these people have such power or near total power and control over seminarians, it's intended to be carried lightly, exercised justly, and with wisdom. But as the famous Roman writer Juvenal is attributed to have said, sed quis custodiet ipsos custodes. But who will guard the guardians themselves? Who watches Who watches the watchers, right? Uh, and I just come flat out and I said, I said, some of these formators, they've undergone their own priestly formation, but just because now they've had the holy hands on them and they're priests doesn't mean that they are now somehow immune to error. They are very much products of their time. Uh, difficult of our, of our time, and some of them are very are insufficient to the task as I said entrusted to them, and that's where this is where I get into corporatism specifically. You know, it's a way of seeing the church more like a business. You know, more like a business. Bishops become CEOs of corporations, and the priests their employees. Within this perspective, clerics lose sight of the care of souls and spiritual fatherhood. If such a priest is a formator in a seminary, he might be more interested in advancing himself just as an employee in the secular world works to protect and advance his career. And there's a phenomenon known among clerics, it's actually it's spoken of among clerics, as scaling the Roman ladder. So there are some guys that are just, they just scream, make me bishop, I want to be a bishop, I want to be a bishop, I want to be a cardinal, I want to be a cardinal. And others that know what's going on say, he's trying to scale the Roman ladder. You know, this is the speak that goes on even among the clergy. And so whatever doesn't look good in this system to the cleric's boss in this case, the bishop, the rector, or some other authority, is deeply feared by corporatists. And this human respect places their own good above that of the seminary, and going back to that, keeping seminarians' interest and best heart, best interest at heart. And it destroys that mutual trust that is supposed to be present. And under corporatism, I said, formators face the temptation of always having to protect their image. Making mistakes that are uh, that are obvious and apparent, even to seminarians, projects incompetence. In my own time as a seminarian, um, I I witnessed this incompetence. Uh, in the letter from that I was given, that stating that I was being put on probation, I was told that my probation was going to be reevaluated at the end of the fall semester, so presumably December. Um, when I asked about this, uh, to my vocations director, he told me this was, uh, I believe it was January 19th, 2019. He actually told me, uh, he's like, well, Kevin, you know, when I read that, he's like, I presume it was going to be your yearly evaluation, March or April. And I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? The document said December. And he said, well, no, Kevin, based upon my years of all my, all my experience being a vocations director, when I read it, that's how I interpreted it. 
So I looked at him. I was bold and gutsy. I looked at him and I said, well, Father, I don't have that years of that, those years of experience. And when I read a document that says, you know, end of the fall semester or December, you know, I, I take it at face value, right? Well, uh, that was the end of that conversation, to keep it simple. But I, and I never, I wasn't told about the status of this probation. Fast forward eight months. I kid you not, eight months and minus a week. It was September the 12th, 2019. That was the first time that I had heard that, in fact, my probation, I was off of it. That's incompetence. You notify, and well, I, it was a seminary official who told me about this. I was notified eight months after the fact. They met in early January of 2019. And before, mind you, the conversation I had with my vocations director. And I said, I'm thinking to myself, why am I being told this now eight months later? The, the, at the very least, this is incompetency. But I couldn't say this out loud. If I had said this out loud, I would have been screamed at, literally. Because the same guy that notified me that I was off probation had yelled at me because I spoke Italian one day to the dean of the theologate. I said five words in Italian. Buongiorno, padre, va bene? And I was yelled at for that. We have pedophiles running around the church, but they worried about me saying five words in Italian to the dean of the, of the theologate. Priorities. But this is what happens. This, you know, under corporatism, you know, they have to protect their image. Another true story. I was in class one day and a seminarian who has since died, um, he got up to go to the bathroom and all of a sudden the professor, a priest uh, and a seminary official stopped him. And made him sit back down and started for the next, I went, I'm not lying, five minutes. This is a true story. If I'm lying, I'm dying. For like five minutes went on this tirade about how rude and disrespectful we are for going to the bathroom during class. And he said things like, you know, if you, if you have to go to the bathroom during class, don't bother coming back. Well, I'm sitting in my seat. I'm listening to all of this. And again, at adult vocation, I have certain skills and experience. I used to be a teacher. I'm sitting there listening to this, and I'm thinking, you have no bathroom policy on your syllabus. When you went over your syllabus, there was no verbal instruction on a bathroom policy. All, this was February that this event happened, by the way. For the past six months, that five, six months that we've been with you in class, I'm sitting there and I'm running through my head all these, I'm like, this is completely unprofessional. Why is this suddenly a problem? People have been getting up discreetly and respectfully and have gone to the restroom and come back. I'm like, what is the problem here? And during the course of this, this five-minute tirade, the professor, finally, this priest professor, in a, in a fit of anger, outs what happened. An auxiliary bishop of the diocese of this seminary happened to be at the seminary that day, or, or one day. And during the class, the same seminarian that wanted to go that this one, that time we were being yelled at, the time that uh, he, he was supposed to be at the bathroom, the auxiliary bishop caught the seminarian at the other end of the building during class. And the bishop I, I recognized, the, recognized the guy and approached this priest and said to him, well, yeah, I saw so-and-so was down to the other, you know, down there during your class. And the priest, after relaying this story, said to, yelled at us and said in so many words, do you know what it's like to have that happen to you? To have my friend, the bishop, you know, say that to me? 
As soon as he said those words, I sat in my chair with a certain amount of self-satisfaction. I was like, ah, now I know what's going on. Now I got, I, I've got the script. The priest, who himself is a seminary official, was look, he now looked bad to his superior that he couldn't control his class or didn't know what was going on in his class. The seminarian was making him look bad. And this guy, oh, you know, had this position and he had to he had to do his job well, you know. Uh, so he yelled at all of us. He didn't talk to the seminarian. He yelled at all of us. He took it out. He took out his shame and humiliation on out on all of us instead of speaking to the guy in question. This is a true story. It happened. I'm not. I'm. I'm not joking. I'm not making up any of this stuff. But this is an idea. This is an example of what I'm talking about. Of this corporatist attitude. They have to make themselves look good. If they don't, it's like this pecking order. And they take it out on other people. And this is just one example of it, unfortunately. Um, and I couldn't say anything, as I said, because if I did, I'd be, I was, in my mind, I was still under probation, even though it was February. And technically, I was supposed to have been off of it in, in January. So they cannot project incompetence. In the case with the vocations director, I think that he just didn't know when he said the whole May and April thing. I thought about this afterwards when I found out things about what was on. I was like, I just don't think he knew. I might be wrong, but I think he was covering up. And in the case of the the bathroom incident, shall we say, that was just, you know, that just looked like he wasn't in control. Oh boy, that that is a capital sin uh among clerics. It's a capital sin. If you are if you don't look like you're in control, you know, you you're you're done. You're done, son. You know, what happens then when officials, as I say in the article, who are either corrupt, lack faith, or suffer the loss of that Catholic sense that I mentioned earlier, or just influenced by erroneous ideas, wield the power and control customarily afforded to them over seminarians? What is to be done when seminarians are confronted by things such as greed, mismanagement, psychological gamesmanship, careerism, corporatism, among a number of other chronic issues? As corruption might pertain to seminary formators personally, when they wield power and control over seminarians, life becomes quite difficult. Um, there's that, first of all, I was talking about that, that danger of being malformed in different ways. That dependency upon the system that gets inculcated within guys, if they don't have that healthy balance, they can come to depend upon the system so much that they lose that ability or compromise the ability to be providers and independent thinkers. And independent thinkers, thinking outside the box, that das ist verboten. It, it, it it's it's forbidden. You you are not allowed to do this. I'm sorry to say, but it, it's it's highly frowned upon. They want group think. They want heard. I heard of a seminarian, former seminarian, recently. He was he was he was he was army. Uh, I believe a ranger. I think he saw combat. He was in seminary for one year and left. He told a friend of mine recently. He's like, you don't understand. He's like, I couldn't do what they wanted me to do. I've I've seen combat. I can't do what they wanted me to do. He's like, that's, it just, it, it was incompatible. Well, yeah, no duh. <laughs> um, so the example uh, of this is like with independent thinking. What if a, if a priest, a priest maybe disagree with something respectfully, but what happens there if there's a contention with the bishop, you know, is he going to rock the boat or, or not? And that's why I tell a true story. There was a young priest who was told to commit some liturgical abuse, and he refused. The bishop sent him to a, to a remote deanery of his diocese, and the pastor there had been given explicit instructions to break this priest of his rigidity and inflexibility. Two very powerful words, by the way, in formation. Guys are taught to fear those words. Well, uh, you know, that's what happened to the guy, but what I didn't tell everybody in the story is how that story ended. Oh, they broke him, all right. They broke him. This guy got to such a low point in his vocation and 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 in his priesthood, he was caught out in the in the stairs to the choir loft with uh, making out with a woman, and that now he was compromised, and they got him. Now he's a compliant. I'm told he's a very compliant, suppliant guy. You know, because 
he did wrong. He broke his vow of, of, of celibacy, you know. But if I may, Mike, I have to say something. When I heard about the story originally, and I know I know the priest. Uh, when I heard the story, <laughs> my first thought was, well, that was refreshingly heterosexual. <laughs> Being caught up <laughs> making out with a woman. I was like, well, that was refreshingly heterosexual. <laughs> Uh, you know, you hear you hear horror stories otherwise. Um, but no, yeah, he got he was compromised. They got him. Now they could load it over his head, you know. Um, and oh yeah, now now I'm told he's going along to get along, you know. Um, but at the time, you know, there's that moment of choice. Do I obey what this bishop is telling me to do, even though he has no authority to tell me to break liturgical law, or do I say no? You know, that, that was the moment of choice. Some acquiesce to unlawful requests, as I said in the article, for different reasons, fear or ignorance of the most common, I said, but others do it because they seek higher office. They've already, they, they, they've, they've, they've got the script for corporatism and they want to scale the Roman ladder. And if they jeopard, if they offend their bishop, they're going to jeopardize their chances of, you know, uh, you know, being, you know, rising up the ranks. Some guys think that parish work is beneath them. I didn't talk about this one in the article, but some think it's beneath them. And so that's why they want to go to higher office of being like a, a rectory, um, uh, like a, a seminary or some other organization because they just don't want to do parish work because it's very brick and mortar, as they say. Uh, and they don't want to do that. Well, tough. Um, and this acquiescence is taught and it begins while he's in the seminary. Men there in seminary, they're often told if they don't go along with what they are told, in other words, obey blindly, depending upon the issue, they'll be labeled as rigid, inflexible, unwilling to be formed, or worse things. And this is when I talk about uh, a scandal that happened. I talked with a seminarian. I know him personally, um, and he did get ordained eventually. And there was a homosexual scandal in his in this guy's seminary. Uh, and when it got exposed, I was talking with this guy privately one day, and he was just like, "I have to trust the four meters because I can't conceive the alternative." But it was the—I mean, it was the, these are the four meters, and even the, arch, uh, the, 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 the archbishop too. That was that that enabled the scandal to happen. So how do we reconcile this? This guy just. Just put the blinders on. He he couldn't deal with it. Well, you know, this is what's go these are the things going on in seminaries nowadays. Um, you know, guys are taught to fear being labeled with these words rigid, inflexible, unwilling to be formed. Because if they want to get ordained, the expression is they have to demonstrate their willingness to be formed. Well, there's a very close association between the word formed with controlled in many uh, it, they're all they're basically synonymous in some quarters of priestly formation um and a guy who keeps his own counsel and his own mind becomes a danger to corrupt seminary officials and arguably to diocesan superiors um and that becomes a problem because you know, C.S. Lewis famously uh, referred to Aslan in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe about how he is a good lion, but not a tame lion. You know, he's a, he's a good and a man is a good man, but not a tame one. There's a certain sense of adventure. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier with that strength that a man has and is supposed to be for others. Otherwise, it becomes toxic, that toxic masculinity that we talked about earlier. That wild or that adventure in him is meant to assist him in his God-given duties and responsibilities. And his mentors, usually older men, are, are help to train to orient a young man towards that good, you know. So in this case, using his strength for others. But this is quite opposite nowadays because the fatherless running around society trying to prove themselves in all the wrong ways, as I say, you know. So these facts of human nature are no less true for celibate clerics, you know. A, man, a father does not need to know what to do or when to act when his child is in danger. He just does it. You know, 
that's why like I hear these things about you know the bishops shuffling around abusive priests and stuff. It's like, no. What he abused children. Why are you keeping him in what? You know, it's a failure in fatherhood, you know. Um it, but it, it it I mean it's, it is what it is. And there's supposed to be that unity and harmony between a bishop and his priest as they work together for the salvation of souls and the spreading of the kingdom of God on earth. But this gets marred by sin and bad ideas. You know, it's 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 sad. And the, a lot of seminarians and priests learn to be obsequious to their bishops, to obey and submit without question. But yet that famous gesture of putting your hands in the bishop and promising um uh, making making promises of, of obedience and respect, you know, that's a futile gesture. And it's a two-way street. A priest does that, but the bishop is also supposed to honor that as well and protect. So that's that that half of it gets uh you know gets gets a little forgotten. Um but we've uh, we, we've been at this a little while, and I don't want to burden people unnecessarily. So it might be a good idea to have a have a, a kind of have like a part two for this. So I'm going to end on that note, but basically, but by 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 saying that uh, there's a little bit more to get to, and uh, a whole bunch of stuff to get to go through, and I, I look forward to sharing this with everybody. Hopefully, um, you know what I've shared thus far has been, you know, at least somewhat edifying, but I do want to get into some solutions as well uh, and some ideas to put out there. So that, well, hopefully we'll get to that in, in part two. Yeah. I think the solutions would definitely be helpful. I mean, we, we sure need them these days. I really appreciate you coming on and doing this part one. We'll, we'll do part two very soon. Go ahead and uh, also put in a plug for your, your content. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, we saw the article earlier, you know, um, and uh, I, like I said, I also wrote about the, the third part of The Secret of Fatima, the St. Michael book. You did that talk recently on uh, The Smoke of Satan. We, I talked about that in my, uh, as well in my, my St. Michael book. Um, and I am happy to say there is going to be a second edition of the Fatima book. I got the approval from the publisher. So, yay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So And also my website, kevinsimmons.com, K-E-V-I-N-S-Y-M-O-N-D-S.com. Uh, Feel free to send a missive and uh, and do and do pray for those people that I mentioned earlier. Thank you. Absolutely appreciate you coming on. We'll do part two uh, very soon here, so everybody stay tuned for that. And don't forget to All hit right. that subscribe button, that like button, and also check me out patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. If you want to support me, see you later. God bless.